Thank you, Brent. And uh, thanks to the organization committee for the invitation to speak. And I'm going to mainly focus on genetic variants instead of RNA editing today. But uh, we are working on um, how these RNA binding proteins may affect RNA editing is for another day. Okay. Um, maybe I'll use the mic. Okay. So Brent gave a really good overview about uh, splicing and gene regulation. So I'll be very brief. And since today's talk is on genetic variation, so I'll mention um, the different pathways that genetic variation may in impact gene regulation. And this is from a review paper written by Jonathan Pritchard and his um, co-authors. And shown here SNPs, and um, they're influencing different pathways of genetic uh, gene regulation. So obviously, SNPs can impact epigenetic modifications or transcriptional initiation. And we have heard a lot of exciting talks in the past two days about these aspects. And in addition to these um, epigenetic and transcriptional regulation, there is increasing appreciation about post-transcriptional regulation and how genetic variations may influence uh, such as pre-mRNA processing, including alternative splicing and post-transcriptional processing and uh, mRNA stability or RNA export or translation. So there are different aspects of post-transcriptional processes that may be influenced. And so I will be very brief on splicing, and I think this was touched upon by the questions um, in Brent's talk as well. Um, both DNA elements and RNA elements may influence splicing, and there is crosstalk between epigenetic regulators and splicing regulators. And the most obvious pathway that affects splicing and the most dominant uh, is perhaps the RNA binding proteins that they influence the regulatory elements that are encoded in our RNA and also um, influence other aspects of RNA processing in addition to splicing. So regardless of the mechanism, um, what we are interested is um, identification first, um, to identify what splicing events may be influenced by genetic variation. And then after that, we can deal with the question of mechanism. So in our lab, we first took an allele-specific approach. So because in the ENCODE and other um, big projects, we have accumulated a large amount of RNA-seq data. So using the RNA-seq data alone, can we examine the genetic variants within the RNA-seq reads? So we took an allele-specific approach, and this is just a hypothetical example that to show the underlying principle in our approach. So suppose you have an RNA binding protein or splicing factor that has a very specific sequence preference, and if you had a C allele in a SNP, then the factor binds very well, but if you have a G allele, then the binding is abolished. And suppose this splicing factor enhances the splicing. So if you had a C allele in the exon, then recognized by the splicing factor, and you may splice by including this middle exon in yellow. But in other case, if you had a G allele, then binding does not occur, and without this splicing enhancer, then you may not have splicing of the middle exon, then you have the skipping of this exon. So in the RNA series, what we observe normally in the poly-A selected RNA-seq would be that the RNA-seq reads um, contain predominantly the C allele in this case because the G allele induced exon skipping and you cannot observe that in the RNA-seq reads. Okay, so given this kind of rationale, we developed an approach and published in 2012 to identify these exonic SNPs that may affect splicing. And what about the intronic SNPs? So using regular poly-A selected RNA, we actually missed most of the intronic content in the RNA series. And to go after these intronic uh, splicing regulators, we actually made use of the ENCODE uh, cell fractionation RNA data that was generated in Tom Gingeris group a few years ago. So for a number of ENCODE cell lines, we have four different types of RNA seq data, and they are se um, separated into nuclear RNA or cytoplasmic RNA, and they can be poly-A minus, which means uh, without poly-A tails, and then polyadenylated RNA. So we have these data, so we developed 
a new approach to deal with the intronic regulators. And first of all, we wanted to examine the data sets, and after mapping these reads to the uh, genome and transcriptome, we found that, um, as we expect, the nuclear poly A minus RNA is enriched with intronic contents, so um, a lot of reads map to the introns, and then your intronic reads decrease. So we were very happy to see this because this means that we can make use of these nuclear poly A minus um, RNA seq data to examine the intronic content of these RNA. So our new method is called IGMIS. It's identification of the intronic tag SNPs for genetically modulated alternative splicing. And this is the uh, uh, rationale for this approach. Uh, suppose now we are focusing on an intronic um, SNP, which has an A or G allele here, and this intronic SNP is a regulator, so that's our assumption, a regulator of splicing. If you had A allele, then you have exon inclusion. If you had G allele, you had exon skipping. And just ignore the exonic SNP for now. And if we look at nuclear poly A minus RNA, then you would observe some of these reads came from the spliced out products. So these are the splicing intermediate products that will eventually be degraded. But uh, at the snapshot where we took the RNA, we may have captured these kind of RNA molecules. Okay, so if we look at paired and reads, in this case, all of the encode RNA-seq data in these cell lines are paired and. So if we look at the pairs, and if we have reads covering the intronic SNP, and we have reads that cover the exonic regions, then we can um, examine the allelic content for this SNP of the intronic SNP that we are interested in. And in this case, if you are examining spliced out products, and in this example, the A allele will not be associated with pairs of reads that cover the intron and exon, but the G allele will. So you will observe a significant allelic bias uh, by comparing A and G. Of course, there are some subtleties here. We have nascent RNA that can also be captured by this protocol, and they're not spliced out products. So we developed a Bayesian approach to estimate um, the fraction of the nascent RNA, which I don't have time to go into details. And because we also have cytoplasmic poly A plus RNA, so we can examine these um, mature RNA molecules as well. And if there were, um, there was an exonic SNP um, to start with, then we can observe this SNP uh, in the exon, in the mature RNA, which as a, uh, serves as a validation of this approach. Okay, so uh, we apply this method to a number of INCO cell lines listed here, and in total, uh, we applied both the intronic and the exonic methods to identify both types of SNPs, and we identified 622 SNPs that can um, be predicted as uh, regulators of alternative splicing, and we did some randomization to control um, and estimate FDR, which is about 3%, uh, and we did experimental validation, and here we use splicing reporter assays in the HeLa cell lines, and our validation rate is 80%. If we use an additional cell line, so because the splicing factors may be cell type specific, then our validation rate can be as high as 90%. Okay, so with these events, we wanted to understand a little more about the splicing regulation, and first of all, we examined whether the different cell types um, share common events. If you have a SNP in two different cell lines, the same SNP, does it induce the same type of splicing regulation? And the answer is that, uh, yes, it is um, much more significantly overlapping across cell lines than you would expect by chance. So indicating that the genetic variants that alter splicing may be quite ubiquitous across cell lines. And we also examined evolutionary conservation of these events. And as you can see here, uh, we separated coding events and non-coding events and examined their controls respectively. And if you look at both coding here and non-coding, you can see that these GMAS exons are less conserved than the controls and it's uh, statistically significant. And indicating that these regions may be um, 
uh, evolving faster than the controls. And if we look at the sequence identity between human and other genomes along evolution, then you can see that the divergence occurred before primate um, appeared in the evolutionary tree. So they have, the GMAS exons have accelerated sequence evolution in primate so lineages specifically. Okay, we also examined the overlap of GMAS SNPs with the GWAS SNPs. So there are a lot of GWAS SNPs which uh, we do not have an indication of functional involvement. Um, and we have over 100 GMAS SNPs that are in the ILD with GWAS SNPs associated with different traits. And for GWAS SNPs and GMAS SNPs that are in the same gene, located in the same gene, which accounts for 66% of these GMAS SNPs, a lot of them are in the introns. So a lot of GWAS SNPs that we could explain through the GMAS pathway uh, were located in the introns. And similarly for GWAS SNPs that are in different re, um, genes as the GMAS SNPs, there are also a majority of them in the introns. So we could explain a lot of intronic GWAS SNPs that were not um, known to be associated with non-functional implications through the splicing regulation. Okay, so now given these hundreds of GMAS events, what are the mechanisms that um, is mediating the uh, SNP regulation of GMAS or alternative splicing. So as uh, we talked in the background slide, the most dominant mechanism or pathway is uh, RNA binding proteins that regulate splicing. And we predicted through motif search uh, to see which splicing factors may affect the GMAS SNPs. And we identified uh, this list of splicing factors. And I want to highlight the first one, which is SRSF1 that affects the most um, number of GMAS SNPs. And luckily, we had the ENCODE RNA-seq uh, data set generated by Brent's group uh, where we had SRSF1 knockdown. And we also had eclipse data generated by Gene Yaw's group for this protein. So we could validate whether our predictions were correct. So basically, these exons that we predicted to be under regulation by this protein, uh, the majority of them showed a splicing change when we knock down the protein, so that confirms the prediction. And similarly, the majority of them had eclipse-seq um, binding sites. And also, using the eclipse data, we could um, actually analyze the SNPs within the binding sites, and we saw that most of these eclipse peaks are associated with allele-specific binding. So there is an allelic bias in the binding sites themselves. Okay, so these serve as very nice validations. And we also did experimental validation. In this case, it's an in vitro gel shift assay to show the allele-specific binding of um, this protein given a G allele or A allele um, in one of the target exons um, or introns. Okay, and we did a bunch of these gel shift assays. But what I want to draw your attention to is this um, pictogram where we see the motif of SRSF1, and then we ask uh, where does this SNP um, that influence splicing often fall into? And interestingly, we found that the majority of them actually target this nucleotide in the motif, and a small, uh, about 30% of these SNPs target the strongest consensus motif. So this is interestingly consistent with what uh, Mike Snyder uh, yesterday reported for uh, transcription factors that the SNPs oftentimes do not target the strongest consensus nucleotide, which I will come to later um, in this talk. Okay, so we have all these splicing factors predicted, and we are using the other ENCODE RBP knockdown and ECLIP data to make global predictions, which I will not have time to talk about today. But what I will talk about is the conservation patterns of these splicing factors. So for the predicted splicing events, the GMAS events, I said that they are uh, evolving faster. So their conservation level is less than the controls, but for the splicing factors, it's the opposite. These splicing factors tend to um, conserve at higher levels than controls, um, than other splicing factors that are not predicted um, as regulators of GMAS events. 
okay? Um, and if we look at the consensus motifs of splicing factor, just as what we did for SR, SF1, of course, um, on average, these splicing factors have strong consensus because if a SNP, a single nucleotide change, can alter the binding of this protein, then that means the protein is very likely to have a strong consensus, a strong binding affinity to certain motifs. So that's what we found. The motifs are, on average, they have higher uh, information content in their, motif, uh, in their motif strengths. But if we look at the single nucleotides, I just as what we did for the SR, SF1 protein, then um, we found that the GMIS SNPs oftentimes uh, fell into the nucleotides that had higher consensus strength than what you expect by chance, okay? But oftentimes, it's not, it's less than the nucleotide that had the, the maximum consensus strength. So which is consistent shown here for the SR, SF1, the nucleotide that often targeted by the SNPs is not the strongest one. And interestingly, if we go to these SNPs that have linkage disequilibrium with GWAS SNPs, then these uh, GMIS SNPs tend to have higher um, consensus strength, indicating that these um, likely functionally relevant SNPs are disrupting the stronger nucleotides in the motifs. So in summary, we used um, ENCODE RNA-seq data and identified more than 600 alternative splicing events that may be regulated by SNPs or mutations. And we found that oftentimes these events are regulated by splicing factors through allele-specific binding. And these exons demonstrated accelerated evolution, uh, but they are regulated by highly conserved proteins with strong sequence consensus. And the ENCODE, RBP knockdown, and ECLIP data have been essential for inferring the regulatory roles of the proteins in the GMIS. Okay, with that, I'd like to thank people in my lab who did uh, this work, uh, computational work and experimental work. And I'd uh, specifically thank the data production groups of ENCODE, uh, Brent Gravely's group for producing the RBP knockdown RNA-seq data, Jin Yao's group for generating the ECLIP data, and Tom Gingera's group for generating the cell uh, fractionation RNA-seq data, and thank NHGRI for, for funding. And thank you for your attention. I'd like to take questions. There. Thank you. Hi. Um, how far into the intron from the exon boundaries did you go to find the SNPs? Oh, that's a great question. Um, we used about 300 nucleotides only. Yeah. And uh, also, the, because we require the paired and the reads to cover the intron and the exon, so by default, because of the RNA-seq library generation, they are quite close. So we are restricted to intronic regions that are close to exons. And did you find a difference between the ones that were closer to the exon boundaries than farther away from it? Yes, in general, there is a trend where um, if the SNP uh, fell into the splice site regions very close to the exon, it tends to have a much stronger impact on splicing. And then there is a distribution of strengths um, uh, negatively correlated with the distance. Yeah. Hey. Hi, yeah. beautiful Hi. talk. Um, I want to ask you more general question and more related with your opinion about that. But related with um, being um, imprinted uh, region, right, or imprinting regions, have you, um, and there, there are like, in some of them, there are like very long mRNA transcripts, right, that they don't even know where the promoter is. Um, have you like look or know if these SNP uh, differences between alleles or splicing variants can like be involved in the expression of different transcript from different alleles in the imprinted regions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. So for the imprinted genes, um, we, if we do allele-specific expression analysis, we often see them to be uh, well revised. And unfortunately for splicing, we are look, uh, looking at a local region, a small region around the exon or within the exon. So we don't deal with um, the imprinted regions um, in this case, but they are in the RNA-seq data and they are very obvious. They oftentimes are the strongest allele, um, 
specific expression targets. Yeah, but for splicing purposes, we didn't consider them. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Grace. Um, so your conservation and GWAS analyses suggest that there's many of these SNPs that don't aren't strongly deleterious or don't have a big functional effect. Have you thought about next steps for trying to figure out some of those more subtle effects that they might have, for example, computationally by looking at mm -hmm. allele frequencies or functionally through experiments? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so we were trying to follow up on different directions uh, for that, and uh, we tried to look at the population-wise, these alle allelic frequencies, and tr relate uh, to or ask questions whether these SNPs are tend to be positively selected. Um, and um, it turns out that a lot of these SNPs are located in positively selected genes, and their allelic frequency and distribution across different populations in the 1000 Genomes Project tend to show evidence of positive selection. Um, other than that, we are more interested in the regulatory mechanisms uh, after we identify them using the RBP data sets uh, within the INCO data. So that's another direction that we are going um, after uh, for the follow-up work. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, yeah. yeah it's very nice uh, work. So uh, in your study, did you see there's another uh, factor, uh, SRSF3, have been observed too? Oh. Uh, I have to go back to the list. Uh, SRS. Uh, right now, we don't have it. Uh, so we are trying to analyze more data sets. So here, we analyze only a limited of seven or eight uh, data sets, uh, cell lines. So we are trying to expand them to much more uh, different cell types with different genetic backgrounds. Um, so that may enrich our analysis. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Dr. Gravely had to run to catch a flight, so I'll be closing the session, but I'd like to thank our speakers for